Good evening. Good to see y'all today. I got. I'm gonna start off with a question because this this is gonna sound kind of strange to you whenever I ask you this question. But if somebody was to ask you, what can you afford? What can you afford? Well, a lot of people might say, well, I could probably buy a good pack of gum or something like that, or, or some might be talking about, and, that, and what we tend to do is we tend to, whenever somebody asks you what can you afford, we'd probably start poor-mouthing, wouldn't we? We'd feel like it, we wasn't able to afford anything, but I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about could you afford you a house or a car. You know, because every one of us, if it's something that we really want, you know, we're going to find a way to get those kind of things. We're going to find a way to find out how we can, can get us a place to live and how we can get around. We're also going to think about, we wouldn't even ask or question, would we be able to buy us some clothes? Of course, we're going to find some kind of way to get us some clothes. So we'll say, you know, I can afford me some clothes. I may not have a different change all the time, but I, I'm, I can take care of that. And we... You know, a lot of times they say, well, you know, I can't afford to send my kid to a, to a nice college or something like that. But, you know, if that's where your priorities was, that would, you know, you'd be able to afford something like that. And people say, you know, I can't afford, we hear this, I can't afford to retire. And the reason we say we can't afford to retire is because, is because that's not what we're focusing on. That's not what we want to do all the time. It's, you know, people want to keep on and keep on going, and, and they want to keep on living their life. You know, I had a person today who says, I want a boat. He told me, he said, I want a boat. He said, but I can't afford it. And I thought, you know, if, if, if you wanted a boat bad enough, you'd find a way to afford it, because isn't that the way we are? We're the point in our life. Whatever we want, we'll find a way to afford it. But I, but I do have another question. What can you afford to lose? See, whenever you think about that, if, if there's things that we want so bad, we're going to do everything in our power to make sure that we can afford that thing that we want with all of our heart. That's just the way we, uh, that's our human nature. But what can we afford to lose? See, could we afford to lose memories? You know, I look back and now I'm seeing my children get get, get uh, grown and, I, and I'm thinking about whenever they were little bitty kids and I would carry them in my arms and, I, and everything, everything about that I was just, man, I had my thumb on everything that they did. If I say go, they went and if I say no, they didn't. But now they're getting, getting older and they're getting to the point that they're making decisions on their own. So, but I still have those memories just like all of you do. We still have them and there's they're something that we hold on to. You know, could we really afford to, to lose out on help? You know, somebody that would help us. It might be somebody that spiritually helps us, somebody that's praying for us, somebody that, that's the type of person that if we have trials in our life, we could go to them and, and we would know that they'd give us godly wisdom. So we can't afford to lose people like that because in today's time, those kind of people are, are hard to come by, people that you go to for, for spiritual uplifting whenever we're in spiritual warfare right now. So what do we do? We call, our, we call our brothers and sisters in Christ and we, and we tell them, hey, I want you to be praying for me. I've been sick and I've been going through a trial and my mother's not doing well. All these things we, we have and, and we really can't afford to lose people like that because those are the kind of people that we hold on to and we have good relationships with. But you know, there's something else we can't afford to lose either. We can't afford to lose our happiness. You know, there's people out in this world right now that they've lost their joy. They've lost their joy. They've lost their excitement. They've, they've lost their, their enthusiasm for living. And they get to the point in their life that they're saying, you know, I just don't know what I'm going to do. You know, things around me are crumbling. I don't know about y'all, but I don't feel like things around me are crumbling. I feel like that just like Stan just got through praying. He said, Lord, give us an opportunity. Well, all I feel like is there's opportunities around us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the opportunities are everywhere now because I'll tell you what I'm noticing. A lot of lost people. There's a lot of people who does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior in their life. They've had a little bitty taste of Him, and then they turn away from Him, and they're going into the world, and they're not following Christ Jesus. You know how I know? Because I, because I see it. It's going on. So, so I can't afford to lose my happiness. I can't afford to lose my zeal. 
I can't afford, there's a lot of things that I can't afford to lose because what makes me and you what you are is what's inside you that drives you to that cross. What's inside you that drives you that, that one day you was without Christ and then all of a sudden Jesus Christ came down with his spirit and he touched your heart and he changed your life and he changed you forever. Listen, I can't afford to lose that passion that I got whenever I asked Jesus Christ to come into my heart. You know why? Because he expects me to grow. He don't expect me to fall and wither away. So I, I think about that, and, and listen, it, I can't afford to lose my passion either. You know, I, I, I think about this because we just got through singing that song, What a Day It'll Be, When My Jesus I Shall See. When I look upon His face, see, I want y'all to know, that drives me, that gives me passion to know that one of these days, I'm going to get to see Jesus face to face, that this right here is not the place I'm going to spend my eternity. I will not be here after I see Jesus face to face. I will go to be with him. And the Bible says, just like that song says, there'll be no crying there, no more heartaches to bear, oh, no more sickness, no more pain, no more crying over there. Listen, forever I will be with the one who died for me. He died for me. See, I know that you're feeling right now. He died for you just like he died for me. Listen, Jesus Christ died for all mankind, and we can't afford to get things wrong in our spiritual walk and our spiritual life. So if you'll turn in the Bible to Mark chapter 8, verse 36, I want to share this with you. Jesus was talking. He was talking to his disciples. He was talking to people that he loves. And listen, what he's done is he's given us the word of God. And he went from talking to the people that he loved, his disciples, to talking to us, the ones that he loves. So that's the reason that we open up the word of God, so we can get the love of Jesus Christ through his word. But listen to what he said in Mark chapter 8, verse 36. The Bible says, For what shall it profit a man? Or what will a man gain? It says, if he shall, if he shall, a man shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. See, I want y'all to know we can't afford to gain everything that this world has to offer and lose our own soul. There's people that's out there in this world right now that is getting filthy rich off of fear. There's people that's getting filthy rich off of lies. There's people that's getting filthy rich off of a lot of different things. And you know something, I, I think about that, that one of these days, they're going to look at their heart and they're going to look at their soul and they're going to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, why am I not in heaven? See, I want you to keep this in mind. If you go around and you start talking to evil people and you ask them, hey, do you, you feel like you're going to go to heaven? You know what every one of them is going to say? Yeah, I'm going to go to heaven. But I'll tell you what, it's not going to work like that. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. We're not going to go to heaven by thinking that you're living a good life. It doesn't happen. And we can't afford to play those games because I heard a person say today, he said, Brother Steve, we're living in the last day. I want y'all to know, the first day you took your first breath, from that time on, you was living in your last day. I, every one of us is on borrowed time, and I'm going to tell you, my time may not make it through this message, but if I don't make it through this message, my time is up here on this earth, and I am gone to be with the Lord, and I'm going to spend eternity with Him. And I'll tell you this, I can't afford to make a mistake with my salvation. You know why? Because I got down before God and I got it right. See, there's people that are making mistakes. Listen to what verse 37 says. Or what shall man give in exchange for his soul? You know what? Back, back probably about 20 years ago, there was, a, there was a thing that was going on and it was a, a kind of a cult thing that was going on. And I was, I was hearing kids talking about it and at school, these kids started telling me about about people would sell their soul to the devil in order to get rich. And, uh, and I said, well, it did it work? And they said, well, they're rich. And I, and I would talk to these kids, and I was saying, wait a minute. I said, do you really believe that? And they said, they said they really believed that, and they was talking about that, and they was discussing that. And I told them, I said, you know something? I said, I guess, I guess it's possible. I said, because I sold my soul too. And they'd ask me, they'd say, 
They'd say, Mr. Steve, what, what, what are you talking about? I said, I sold my soul to Jesus Christ. I gave him my soul and I said, listen, I don't care. I don't care if I have anything on this earth. I'm selling my soul to the Lord Jesus Christ and I'm giving it to him and I'm saying, God, I'm going to follow you for the rest of my life. But you know something, there's not been one time, one time that I've ever done, and y'all are thinking, yeah, I can see. I've never done without a meal. I've never had a time that the Lord didn't clothe me. He didn't give me a place to lay my head. And the one thing about it is, is he's given me, the Bible says that he will give you above and beyond all that you can imagine. God is good to his people who love him. Listen, it's important that we pay attention to what God's doing and we don't need to miss out on it. See, Jesus knew at his time was coming that he was going to die. He knew that and he was talking to, in verse 27. He was talking to the people that he walked here on this earth. Do you know, every week I walk in here and I, and I talk to the people that I love the most. You may say, Brother Steve, wait a minute. Bible t- says you love the Lord to God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. That's true. But I want y'all to know something. I love my neighbors, and they know I love them, and every one of you, every one of you are my neighbors. But I'm going to tell you what I do. I give myself to you. You may say, what are you talking about? I give myself every week to make sure that I'm listening to God, and I say, all right, God, what, what are you going to give me? And I, I listen with my heart, I listen with my mind, I listen with my spirit, and I say, God, give me what you want me to present to, to, to the congregation that you've given me. And listen to what Jesus was doing. Jesus was doing the same thing, but he was doing it to his church family. He was doing it to his disciples. And then he would go in the temple and he would start teaching and he would preach. And listen, he's saying, I want you to set that kind of example. And I want you to do that. See, Jesus set an example for all of us, the way to live. And he wants us to do that. He wants us to find our group. You know, I, I noticed on the prayer chain, Miss Wanda, she sent, she sent out a prayer notice to all the ladies that they was having a women's retreat and they were going to, that, and she'll send out, ladies, we're going out to eat this Tuesday or whatever. And, and, I, and what she's doing is she's saying, look, I'm grabbing a hold of these ladies and I'm bringing them in here and I'm, I'm loving on them and I want them to know that I care about them. And then what they do is they bring in more. And they bring people in and they share the gospel with them. It is what's happening right now. I thought about it and I, I use this as an example of Miss Donna where she was sitting here and then she started inviting the ladies to come and, and sit with her. And the next thing I knew, they was up there talking and they were socializing and they was being part of each other's life. It is vital for us to be a part of people's life. And Jesus was doing that. And listen to what he said in Jesus, verse 27 of Mark 8. And Jesus went out and, and his disciples into the town of Caesarea Philippi. And, and by the way, he asked his disciples, saying to them, listen to what he said. He said, whom do men say that I am? Y'all, we can't afford to get it wrong on who Jesus is. And Jesus was telling them, said, look, you need to know exactly who I am. So what did he do? He said, he said who does people say I am? And then listen to what the answer. And it says, and they answered, some says John the Baptist, and some says Elijah, and others, others said that you're a prophet. But Jesus asked them, and he said, I want to know who you say that I am. See, it doesn't matter what other people says Jesus is, because there's people, there's people that whenever that that they don't think about Jesus and they, they use the Lord's name in vain and whenever they and they just throw the name of Jesus out and they just say that they pray and all this stuff and they throw God's name around and say say oh Lord bless them but they, but they don't know who they're calling out to see he's saying I want you to know who I am so listen he asked me he said but who do you say I am if I was to ask you, who do you say Jesus is, I hope that your answer would be to say, he's my Savior. He's my Lord. He's the one that I follow. He set an example for me. He loved me, and I'm following his example. But listen to what Peter said. He said in him, he said, thou art the Christ. 
And listen, after that, the Bible says in verse 30, it says, and he charged them that they should tell no man. And the reason he told them not to tell any man because they were coming to try to kill Jesus. And, they, and, and he was having people that was against him all the time. And whenever I, I read that scripture, I think about this because Jesus, his time on this earth, his time was limited. Whenever we think about how old Jesus was whenever he went to that cross at Calvary, he was 33 years old, and we sit there and we think about this. Many of us that's here, most all of us have, have lived longer than that. But look at the impact that Jesus had on everybody's life while he was walking on this earth. He still have an impact on our lives over 2,000 years ago because, listen, what he did on that cross, he said, I'm going to save those people in 2021 if they call on me. But you know something, people are not calling on Jesus. See, I expected a year and a half ago, I expected a year and a half ago to start seeing full-blown revival. I really did. I expected to see people get their heart right with Jesus Christ. I expect people, and you know, for the first week or two, it was happening. I was seeing people really, really get down and, and get serious with the Lord. But you know something? We're about to celebrate uh, our, our memory of, the, of 9-11 uh, this Saturday. And they've been talking about the 20-year anniversary of this coming up. And people's reflecting back on that. But I want y'all to know that whenever that happened, my, my son asked me because they was talking about it at school today. He got in the vehicle today and he said, Daddy, he said, where were you at on 9-11? I told him, I said, son, I said, I was at, I was at work that day and I, and, and I was there doing my job and all of a sudden there was an uproar going on. And, and everybody started talking about what had happened and everything was going on and everybody stopped and they, and they went to a computer and they looked and seen what was going on. And uh, he, said, he said, well, what did you think then? I, I told him, I said, I said, I thought we was going to see a full-blown revival and I thought we was going to see people saved just one right after another. And he said, really? And I said, yeah. I said, but let me tell you what happened, though, son. I said, that, that day, I said, we'd been having a, having a men's prayer group at that time every morning, every morning. The most we ever had was four people. You remember it, Chuck? We'd have four people that was coming. And Tony, I believe you came a few times to that whenever we was there. And, uh, and, they, and we, all of a sudden, we was having four people was coming. There was people was faithful, and some had come in, wanted to leave, and it was just wasn't much to it. But then after that date, that next day, we had 13 people there in that prayer. Next day, it was even more than that. I think it might have got up the most it was. It was 17 and then it went up to 17, and then it went down to 14, and then it went down to 13, and then by, by a month and a half, we was back down to four. And you know why we was back down to four? It wasn't fresh on our mind anymore. See, everybody thought that the end of the world was coming, so what was they going to do? They thought, you know something? I can't afford to miss Jesus coming back, so I'm going to get into that prayer time. I'm going to start reading my Bible. I'm going to start praying. And then whenever Jesus didn't come back during that, that five or six weeks time, oh, that, you know what they did? They started writing it off like Jesus is not coming back. Let me tell you something. Jesus is coming back. It don't matter if he comes back today or if he comes back 10,000 years from today. It does not matter. Let me tell you, the outcome of your life is going to be the same. You are going to spend eternity somewhere and let me get it into your head that you're going to spend eternity either in heaven with Jesus Christ or in hell with the devil. Period. And so I want to share this with you. It is vital that people does not hold their life and not get things right. You can't afford to miss this now. And listen to what happened right here whenever I read in verse 31. Jesus, he, be, he began to teach them that the Son of God must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, he was going to rise again. Jesus told him, he said, I'm coming out of that grave. And he goes on to say, and he spake with them openly, and Peter took him to side. See, Peter that said, thou art the Christ, Peter said, uh, Jesus, I, I, I need to talk to you a minute. And he brought him over there. And, and I just see Peter, you know, saying, I, I need to talk to you. 
And he took it, listen, he said he took him aside and he, been, he began to rebuke Jesus. And whenever he turned about, he looked at all the other disciples and he rebuked Peter saying, let, let, me, let me share something with you. Peter was saying, look, I, 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 don't, I, I don't want you to die now, Jesus. I'm going to go all the way to the end with you. I'm going to fight for you. I'll die for you. And, and listen, and he did it in quiet. And he was talking. He had zeal about him, but he was quiet. And he was saying, Jesus, let me talk to you. But whenever Jesus seen his heart, Jesus rebuked him openly. See, the reason I preach to you, and, I, and at times I get loud. I, there's, I, there's times I get passionate about what I'm saying. Whenever I told you you're spending one place, you're either going to be in heaven or hell. I got a little bit loud. I didn't mean to. It's just I'm passionate about what, I, what I'm saying because people cannot afford to be wrong with their heart and their salvation. But Jesus, listen to this. Jesus, he turned about and he looked on his disciples and he rebuked Peter saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest the things that be of God. And it says this right here. But the things of men. See, Peter, he was thinking in man's term versus God's term. And I'm going to ask you a question. What terms are you looking at? What are you looking at about your relationship with Christ Jesus? And it said him whenever he called the disciples unto him, it says, it says, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. See, every person needs to be willing to lose everything they've got for the cause of Christ. But you know something? Whenever Jesus called me to, to be a pastor, he didn't say, I want you to sell everything that you have and, and follow me. He didn't tell me to do that. He has told people to do that. He's told people to, to move from where they're at. He, he told me, actually, whenever Jesus called me to be the pastor of this church, I knew it, and four years later, after I ran and fought it and screamed and kicked and fought with God for four solid years, then I came to this church because I knew that that's where I was supposed to be. It got so bad that my wife finally, and she didn't marry a preacher, I promise you, my wife finally came to me and she said, you do know that if you don't go to that church, you're going to be miserable, don't you? And I said, I said, whoo, hon. I said, but I didn't want to be a pastor. She said, and I didn't want to be a pastor's wife either. She said, but you know what you're supposed to be doing. Y'all, it was such a release to me whenever I became y'all's pastor. You have no idea what I'm talking about, but it was such a release to me. Let me, let me give you an example. Let's just say that you, you got a neighbor that you're at odds with. That neighbor's lost. You know that neighbor's lost because the last time you saw that neighbor, that neighbor cussed you out because your dog came over there on your lawn and chewed up your garbage. Sound good? That's a good enough excuse for a good cussing from a lost person about a dog? So you walked over there and you started praying and said, Lord, I just pray that you just, you just uh, Lord, just, just change their heart. Well, th see, that person's heart's not going to be changing until God sends someone to share him with them. And it's supposed to be you. So listen, you're, you're there and for the next four years, you follow me? For the next four years, you stand over there and you keep your dog chained up and you look at that garbage and you hate that garbage pile and you hate that neighbor deep down inside, but you know that you're supposed to be the one that reaches that person's heart. It's you that's supposed to touch that person. And for four solid years, you're miserable. Every piece of garbage you see over there, it makes you mad. Every time you feed your dog that's over there on the chain, it makes you mad. You know why? Because your heart's not in the right place. You're supposed to be there ministering that, but that's where I was at. See, that's where a lot of people are in their life right now. They're miserable. They are miserable because they're supposed to be children of the Savior of the world and telling people about how excited they are to be saved. That's where I was at. And then God called me, and the next thing you knew, I, man, just like that, it was like a release. And then here I am. I, I went back and looked 
I went back and looked at, at your baptism, Landon. I went back and looked at the picture of his baptism, Landon, his, his, his big old brawly joker, and I, and I, and I looked and I, I seen him at, whenever I did his baptism. And praise God, I did his baptism whenever I was, I was black-headed and I was stronger. And I remember him saying, Brother, are you going to be able to get me up? And I told him, I said, Brother, I promise you I'll be able to get you up. And the picture that I saw that was a snapshot of Landon, whenever I saw his picture, all I seen was me doing this, and I seen his toe sticking up. <laughs> and I realized, you remember, I realized that whenever he went down, he says, I'm going all the way down for Christ. And when I come up, it's going to mean something. And I remember that. I remember us talking about it. And I remember, and, I, and you know, I, I look back on those times and y'all are looking at me now to where, I, where I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get to the point that I'm older. I'm going to get to the point that I'm feeble. I'm going to get to the point that I, the gray is going to fall out. I'm going to get to all these points in my life. And I want y'all to know I am so happy and excited that I said, God, I'm going to minister to a bunch of people who have no idea what we're getting into. And here we are. See, whenever I read all these scriptures, I, I think about it because we've got to be we've got to be willing to lose everything about us. We've got to be sold out wholeheartedly to Christ. We must be. Verse 35 says, Whosoever shall shall lose his life shall save it. The Bible tells us plainly that. And it says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but lose his own soul? Or what will a man do in exchange for his soul? Did y'all know that when Jesus went to that cross, he knew you was going to be here today? Did y'all know when Jesus went to that cross, he knew who wasn't also? He knew who was going to accept him. He knew who was going to have passion. He knew that the ladies was going to come and help you get everything ready for the ladies' retreat. He knew all these things back over 2,000 years ago. Nothing surprises him. So let me tell you, everything that's going on in this world, nothing is shocking our Lord. He knows it. I'm about through. I want to share this right here. We've got to tell people. Verse 38 says this. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me. There's a little girl that, that came to me and a young lady came to me Sunday morning. And I know I, know I do this, this to people and I, I do it because it's important. The Bible, this scripture right here means something to me. And, and I always tell people, the little, the little young lady, she got, she got saved. And whenever she got saved, I looked at her and I said, do you want to tell people that you got saved? And she looked at me and she just grinned real big and she said, yes, I do. At that time, they was probably, they was probably, probably three quarters of the church was still in here at that time. And I walked, I walked back to that door and y'all that were here, y'all remember it. I walked back to that door and I went, hey, hey, and I got everybody's attention. Whenever I got everybody's attention, I said, I said, she wants to tell y'all something and she she told y'all that she got saved and that she was going to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. And she smiled. And you know what happened after that? People started flocking to her, telling her how proud they was to her, uh, for her. But listen, what if she would have said, Ah, oh, Brother Steve, uh, I, I, I don't want to tell nobody. I don't want to tell nobody. I just, I, I, I'm not going to do that. Here's your scripture. Jesus himself said, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous, are we here? In this adulterous and sinful generation. Did you know Jesus looked at, at his time as adulterous and sinful generation just like we're looking at our time today as adulterous and sinful generation? You know why? Since the world began all the way back before the flood, it has been an adulterous sinful generation and whenever Jesus Christ comes back and the heavens open up it is going to be an adulterous sinful generation then too he said there's going to be people that's going to be eating and drinking and marrying there's going to be people who's marrying opposite sex there's going to be people who are taking babies there's going to be people who are not living godly lives and they're not serving God and when Jesus comes back they're going to say wait a minute why did all the good people leave? And why are we still here? 
then you're going to see this tribulation. We're not going to see it. I'm not going to see it. Then we're going to see the mark of the beast. Then we're going to see the Antichrist. I'm not going to be here. I'm going to be gone with him. So I'm not fearful for what's coming. I'm not fearful about what this Bible says. I'm excited about what this Bible says because I get to go home to be with the Lord. I cannot afford to be shy in an adulterous and sinful world. Jesus wasn't. And let me, let me go further. He says, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my word in this adulterous and sinful generation of him shall, shall the Son of Man be ashamed whenever he comes in the glory of the Father with the holy angels. I don't know about y'all, but I don't want my Savior to be ashamed of me. I want whenever I get to heaven and I stand before the Lord, I want Jesus to look and say, uh, that's that sweaty, fat preacher right there from Pocahontas. He really loves you. He didn't always know what to say. He didn't always know how to act. He didn't always know how to love. Matter of fact, he didn't always, you put, you put whatever you want to, I don't always know the right things to do. But Jesus is going to say, but he loves me. Can't afford to be wrong. Better make sure that you're right about this. Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. Let's pray. Lord, I come to you, and God, I thank you that that day that you got me on my face that I chose not to be wrong. I chose Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And Lord, you're still my Lord. You're still my Savior. You're still my Redeemer. You're still my Comforter. You're still my joy. Lord, in an adulterous and sinful generation, God, I have joy in knowing that you are my Lord and Savior. So God, I just want to praise your holy name. And Lord, if there's people who do not know you, I pray that they get their heart right with you before it's too late. Because one of these days you're going to come back and get us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Love y'all.